we are live i believe welcome welcome if anyone is here we're going to get underway in just a couple of minutes um for anyone that is uh on the feed whether it be on twitter um or youtube uh, again if you want to retweet this to your followers that will be massively helpful uh, just to get some engagement on the pod. We've not done this before, so we completely apologize in advance if it turns into an absolute mess. Um, but we like, to, uh, we like to put ourselves in a vulnerable situation and learn, don't we, gentlemen? Um, we're going to have a chat uh, feature throughout the show. I am moderating that, so if you make a comment um, through the YouTube live chat, if you put a comment via Twitter, it should, and I say the keyword should, um, show up on my screen. Uh, if your question is relevant, maybe to uh, uh, expand on the conversation that we're having, then I will try and, and add it in at a time where it's appropriate. If it's just a, a different question on a different subject, I will record it. Um, and we may contact you uh, in, in the future and maybe even invite you on to something like this. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome um, all of the, 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 the guests, if we will, for the first Learning and Development live stream podcast. We have our regulars, the, the, the dazzling, charming Marco Sullivan. How are you, my friend? <laughs> We have Britton Thomas, again, selling bikes and whatever gadgets down there in Utah. How are you, sir? I'm good. I got what you need. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the <laughs> iRobot behind your right shoulder. Oh, your left shoulder, sorry. Okay. Um, sure, and, we have, and we have some uh, really special guests with us, uh, again, from a, a variety of different places um, across the globe. So, first of all, we'll start in my, on the top Oh, again, my screen is different from the streaming screen, so I'll look on the streaming screen. Uh, next to Britain on the top right-hand corner, we've got Martin Volk. Martin was uh, a colleague of mine in Nova Scotia, currently in Calgary West. Martin, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, again, if we go down a tier just below myself, uh, we have Jordan Kelly from USA Volleyball. Good morning. Thanks. Morning. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, excellent. And then if we go into the middle on the bottom panel, and I'm not going to try and say your full name because I will butcher it. You can do that yourself. But Vlad, uh, you are currently in Finland. Good mo uh, is it afternoon for yourself? How are you? It's it's evening out here, and the full version of it is Vladislav Bespomoshnov. But Vlad is Vlad. Vlad works. Thanks for having me, Mike. Best name out of the entire group. No question about it. Mind you, Martin, your name's pretty unique. Uh, the Czech meaning of Volk is the wolf. Now, that, that's a pretty cool name. Thank you. Here we are. <laughs> so, um, again, uh, gentlemen, we've, uh, we, we, we threw in some questions. Um, we will do a, a little uh, introduction about, you know, uh, who you are, what you're about. Um, but we got a lot of questions. Um, we have a lot of content now, I think, to maybe get us through a number of weeks if we continue to do this. But today's subject is around... Uh, culture again. It seemed to be quite prevalent in the questions when we uh, uh, received them. So uh, Vlad and Martin, the, uh, obviously you're, you're the two that we'll kind of uh, go towards for the majority of the content today. But before we do so, let's just get to know who you are. Uh, we'll start with you, Jordan. So Jordan, uh, tell us a little bit about you know what you do and uh, you know why you felt the need to maybe come on and have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So I work for USA Volleyball, which is our national governing body for the sport of volleyball in America. And primarily what I do is I work in the high performance department. So more so with high potential athletes that we can identify and train with. As a summary, I'd say we ultimately just try and bridge gaps between those athletes that could potentially one day try out for our Olympic team. So training programs, um, sports science and just working to overall be better at what we can do for our high potential athletes and the sport as a whole. But I'd say that's about a summary of where I come from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Vlad, tell us about, about yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm work here for uh, Viramaki sport Institute of Finland. And uh, here we have our main sport ice hockey. And uh, in our campus out, out here, we have uh, lots of different opportunities for uh, coach and athlete development and for, 
for coach development, we specifically have here the uh, Finnish uh, Finnish University out here, Hagahelia, and also we have the international side where where I am involved as a lecturer. And here we have almost every second coach in Finland that you can poke to. Uh, he graduated from from here, and uh, and I work here as a learning and development coordinator. So I work in a little bit of both in uh, athlete development and uh, coach development too. Excellent. Yeah, hybrid role seems to be quite common um, in many uh, of the, the the organizations that I've certainly had the opportunity to engage with. Uh, glad to have you. And then Martin. Um, a little bit about yourself. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm originally from Czech Republic, where I finished my master's degree in uh, physical education and sports science and uh, finished my UFIA license. But currently living in Calgary, uh, Canada, working as a director of soccer for Calgary West uh, Soccer Club and basically trying to, to grow the club or trying to shape, shape its direction in the future. Whilst uh, trying to go through a pandemic. Uh, as well yeah well welcome um so let's get straight into it um vlad uh, your question was uh, it really jumped out at, at all of us when we were going through them um why don't you ask it and then we'll open it up to the group to, oh, to yeah. have a more of a conversation around it okay let me just uh, read it out here when it comes to studying your own culture what things to look for in history and past dependency how to identify bright spots and build up the training, coaching, leadership, and management around it. And uh, uh, Mark knows me uh, from one uh, conference in, in, in Gisakalio, and there I shared with him one uh, article about one Russian coach named Anatoly Tarasov. And he, he's quite a big figure in uh, Russian sports history, but then uh, he was able to build up the ice hockey system from the scratch pretty much just with uh, one rule book out there. And uh, uh, it's interesting to see how he built up the system in the culture that was at the time. And it's, it's now uh, obviously it looks different. The, the Russian system compared to what it, what it was. And uh, also in Finnish ice hockey, there are a few pivotal points that happen. Uh, and there have been changes to their structure, and it's in, in, interesting to investigate what things have have had an impact on on those. And would be great to hear your insights, guys, on uh, what things to look for and how to utilize those. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, well, I'd love to uh, start this. Or does anybody have anything? I can I can actually ask a question first to. I think you're asking Vlad what things to look for and what things, but first question maybe she, how do we study our own culture? That would be the first question. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Obviously, you know, you need to yeah. take a look at the, uh, what uh, what's out there, the the different uh, micro, micro, meso and exo systems. Like what are, what are the relationships on the levels of, of the exactly. coaching, the management, and then the bigger picture in the in the country of the sport, and then of course there you need to look at what's the what's the bigger cultural things that that surround mm. it and that that separate the your specific club or the our organization from the others. Even working in the same industry but in, in different culture, and it happens so, Mark. I, I think you can agree with me on that that even different cities they they vastly differ from from each other the clubs yeah and i think i agree i think this probably even though we won't probably get to this question there jordan's question with regard to us volleyball as well this probably falls into it is the idea of how so how how do you, you and i think this is relevant to martin as well so I can just give, if, if I'm if I'm okay, to give some of my experience. And I think Britain has Absolutely. something from a club and Mike as well from working in Nova Scotia soccer. So when we in AI, when AIK took the decision to remove its early selection model and reposition itself structurally and pedagogically in child youth sports, the research, we started research and development department basically with the, the aim is to investigate ourselves, to to kind of just look at, okay, who are we? What are we doing? Create our own knowledge. And so I guess the, the, the methods we used were, were like 
ethnographical methodologies, different ethnographical strategies. So that to make this, that would be first, you would probably observe from a diff, its observation from different grains of analysis first. So you would probably start just observing training from a distance, maybe just sitting in the back attending meetings. But we're also doing a lot of document analysis. So we're going through the coach education program, the Swedish FA, um, that a lot of our coaches would have been on because we've had coaches in the club many years and we've coaches that are just going to them. So the new co courses, the older courses, and then a lot of the documents from AIK, the yearbooks, how they worked, what they were doing, what was being written in the newspapers, what, club, what was being said in interviews. So, so it was a lot of like con historical contextual analysis, observation. And then we started getting into participant observation where we were following various coaches and various groups around between to maybe to team meetings, to coach meetings, to practices. And so we were getting more involved in it. And it's from these interactions that uh, these strategies that we started compiling and understanding is what, what um, Vlad, what was happening in the microsystems of practice, which is basically what was happening out in practice, the daily practices. And also getting understanding of what was happening outside out in the other systems heading up upwards the macro system like the coach education the media etc what was been there and this gave us a kind of a fuller richer picture of of who we are why certain coaches work this way why they think this way so possibly some coaches that went through the old coach education that has been changed since 2015 so there would be some sort of path dependency there where they probably worked from a very strict planning paradigm of predetermined coaching points. This is how it's going to be 20 minutes, this 20 minutes, this 20 minutes, this. And it's very, very linear sequential. And they would decide the order probably based due to the coach education courses based on explicit instructions, very explicit. I'm going to show you how you do this. And this ends up going, going into kind of ideas of predetermined passing patterns that players just regurgitate in matches. So that's what we found. So, so by investigating these things, we understood why people were doing and acting in certain ways. So again, we're back to the start where people are at, not where you want them to be. Okay, this is what they're doing. This is where they're at. This is why they're doing it. And I can see in the, uh, in the greater cultural environment, why what's influencing them to do this so coach education media sensationalism and of youth sport in the media which is the international olympic committee have been really focusing on this premature professional uh, professionalization etc so just it's just understanding that and but also we found there's also a lot of good things that a lot of our members were very passionate about the club a lot of the coaches were season ticket holders extraordinarily passionate and really cared with a lot of volunteer workers putting down a lot of time. So there was a lot of good there. So what we tried to do was you would try to amplify the positive and use that energy and dampen what we'd call, I guess, dampen certain constraints. So we, we started developing, um, I guess, a player development um, curriculum, not a curriculum, a player, just a player development model framework a framework yeah, quite a flexible framework based on um ideas of uh, of course ecological dynamics which i've spoken about before ideas of non-linear uh, uh, non-linear pedagogy out in the microsystems of practice etc and again when you're working with these you're challenging people's worldviews so you can't really go in and just say we're doing it this way and that's it you got it through many constant interactions it's like as my friend dennis hortian says Where's the best place you can place the coffee machine to create as many reaction interactions as possible? That's kind of like that's what we try to do then out in the pitch is where's the best place for me to be and with mm -hmm. who to create as many interactions and how often and how can I inspire these people to start maybe, you know, breaking these, moving away from these path dependencies, which are in culturally resilient beliefs, which really underpin so much of um, youth sport at the moment. So mm -hmm. that's just a simple way how we investigated our own cultural own environment. Observation from different grains of analysis, from a distance, moving into participation, 
histo historic and cu cultural analysis of documentations, coach education, club education, club documents, interviews, uh, field notes. We took down notes and we interviewed coaches as well, actually. Yeah, so a lot of interviews then. We selected about nine or ten coaches. And we got great insights of coaches, how they felt, what they thought and how they were feel, uh, feeling at the time. And, yeah, and it's really, really, again, just getting those insights incredibly beneficial to find out where people are at because you have to find out where people are at first if you want to take them on a journey with you mm. i mean uh, what what i hear from from mark yeah, i mean i think that 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 bond that they have it's a professional club you know we know what professional soccer can be like it's like you're part of a religion in itself being a part of that and the fact that they they are invested emotionally into the, the the entity of what the club is mm. you, then you you've you've heightened that that to then be able to then slowly, I guess, drip feed your pedagogy um, so that they can interact with that over time. Um, mm. Obviously, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, unique to your uh, environment, being a professional club. I, I, I'll throw it out to anyone else. I mean, we've got much different, um, uh, different organizations. We've obviously got National Governing Body, a club from Martin, you know, institution there with Vlad, myself and um, Britain, we're kind of in clubs as well. Anyone else, um, you know, heightened, I guess, some positivity based on Vlad's question to slowly start to affect their culture? Has anyone got any stories so that I've maybe got, people I've, listen? I've got a couple of thoughts. Um, and I think when we, when we, you guys have mostly seen this diagram of we've got task, organism, and environment. Um, and <clears throat> Sorry, all of these all of these components are kind of interacting with one another and are dependent on one another, right? So I think one of the things that we look at when we're investigating our culture, we're still trying to figure this out, is what are what are people doing? Mm. Is Mark talking now? Oh, sorry, I'm looking at Twitter. Sorry, Mark. Um, there's a little bit of a delay, but so what are people doing? Um, and then you know, asking the question, okay, why are people doing that? And that generally leads you, that leads you to kind of what the environment looks like and how the environment's left an impression on people. And, you know, within this, I think that, you know, the, the, uh, the graphic of the illustration has, you know, uh, opportunities for interaction somewhere in the middle, right? So we as coaching educators or we as, you know, guides or coaches, um, we don't know exactly how it's going to go, but if we pay attention to, the players, we pay attention to the people and we pay attention to the environment and we look and ask for insights as to what they're trying to achieve. That's the task. And thus something will emerge for us as an opportunity for her for interaction, whether that's on a like a macro level or, you know, in a micro level of just one training session. So I think one of the questions to ask is, okay, what are, what are people trying to get out of their soccer experience or their sporting experience? That therein is the task and then asking who are these people, you know, why do they want that? And then what are the environmental constraints that are, you know, leaving impressions on people, you know, relative to this task? Yeah, of course, there's a lot of sociocultural historical uh, constraints that impinge on, on people's perceptions of what player development is, what training is, what yep. training environment should look like. So, Britain. I mean, what do you do? Because I know Martin can maybe relate to this through his experience here in Nova Scotia and, and, and in Calgary. When you know what it is they want may not be in the best interest of the child. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a really hard question, and I think we have to look at ourselves and uh, you know realize who who are we to tell them what they should want versus what they shouldn't want. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that most people would want to see their kids drop out of the game. Um, and so how we interact with them and how we ask them questions may help them develop a little more, uh, I guess, insight to how they want to approach, you know, their child playing, uh, you know, sport. Mm. I think it's it, for, for us, it's a minority of parents that, um, that worry about their child making it to the highest level. Um, that's a very, very small minority. Um, but, you know, often when you ask people, uh, you know, you ask them why, you know, what are you trying to get out of it? Um, why do you want it? What do you, what do you, what do you achieve when you have, you know, accomplished that task? Um, 
they may think a little bit in broader terms, you know, and even just as uh, us as coaches, um, I, my philosophy has changed dramatically through the course of my coaching journey. Mm. And my task is my task has changed as a result of the, the environment and the people making impressions on me. And I don't think that it's any different for anybody else involved. So really, I mean, what I'm hearing is, is we've all got kind of a hybrid of roles, coach, developers, play developers. The facilitation to navigate, um, you know, the, 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 the stakeholders involved to, to probably grasp a better understanding of what it is that, you know, a, a positive environment should look and feel like. That in itself is, is part and parcel of being in this profession. I mean, it probably opens up a different question of, how often do do we have the skill sets? Do we when we go through these courses, you know, are these even skill sets that are even presented to us? Because it's all usually X's and O's. But really, to affect your culture, you are facilitating high level social cultural conversations, and it's not easy. Martin, I mean, I, I, I'm going to push you, and don't want to put force you into speaking, but you I mean you've experienced this in in different environments. Is there anything that you can add to that conversation? No, absolutely. Actually, I'm going through this phase, you know, or, or this experience for a second time and uh, recent history right now, being in different culture. And, and as, as you guys said, basically, you know, I'm just learning more and more about how important it is to, to engage in these conversations with the people in those in those environments to learn more about what, what is happening. You know, how, how can I actually uh, help uh, engage in these conversations and and before doing any type of inter, you know, interventions, uh, what actually is is wanted from the people to you know to, to to be happening. So it actually relates a lot to to the question I I raised in in you know in the email. And basically, I, I would like to open it up to to everyone if you don't mind. Let's say that you know the values which are shaping the culture you're in are not really aligned with those you have personally or professionally. So the question would be, you know, how, how would you go about that? Would you, would you give up on your values? Would you, you know, basically adjust them to, to the new culture? Or would you stick to your values and try to find strategies or ways how to actually engage in these conversations and, and uh, maybe just try to get some interest of the, you know, of the people around to, to change? Mm -hmm. Big question. Uh, yeah, well, the thing is that... Again, it's like what if you look at the val what what people you um, maybe coaches or parent coaches or whatever it's what they value. Again, by investigating your own culture through, as you said, having conversations, them observing, uh, attending training sessions, listening in on parent meetings or coach meetings, you're getting really good insights of why they have these values and why they think this way. Also, look at true. I would look back at the old coach education stuff in Canada. I did it when I first started doing some work with uh, Jason DeVos. It gave incredible insight for me to understand, okay, this is what they want to change. So mm -hmm. where do we go? And remember I said that we, we just start, the first thing we did, and Mike can back this up, is, okay, we're not going to talk about, because the word teaching was everywhere in their literature. So we said, we're going to remove that. And we're going to speak, just speak about learning. Mm -hmm. So we constrained the conversations with the talent directors to learning, not teaching. So just a simple thing like that would actually change your whole conversation. So it's not really about your values or their values. It's about what's best for the children and their development and over time and their learning in development. Remember, this is learning in development. They are learning in development, meaning they're developing phys uh, physically, they're developing psychosocially, and the culture and the society is developing. So they're actually learning in development. Mm. So what's best for that? So by investigating your own culture, like what you're doing, having these conversations, and then maybe changing some of the language and et cetera, can, can, can really start helping. And then you might find a common ground to, to go somewhere. Because I think there's some really good guidelines now in Canadians, uh, especially in children's license education, to coach education. To yeah, fault, I think. Some good stuff. Language is important. Jordan, you, um, you've got something to offer. Yeah, I think... Mark's hitting it right on the head with what I kind of have bolded and written down from listening to all of that is just the real, you know, investigation of yourself and what you're putting forward. And the other big one that I kind of bolded is him just saying, what is best for the children? And so I think coming from a perspective of a national governing body, 
I mean, we, we have a pretty outlined vision and mission statement and we have five strategic priorities that, you know, go across safety, um, competitive success, growing membership, uh, marketing and brand affiliate, all of that. But at the end of the day, our mission statement ends just by saying that at the end, ultimately the sports are fun and that they provide a lot of valuable lessons and it goes back to what is best for the children. And for my experience right now, coming from the side of high performance is, you know, we, we recently gained a new chief of sport, Peter Vint, and that's all we're doing right now is we're, we're taking this time where we're, there's a, a large pause in what we're doing. We aren't training with our athletes. We aren't, our events aren't going on. And we're purely taking a look internally at what are we doing? And we have about 25 research or data questions where we're saying, what is the actual contact time that we have with athletes? What, what are, you know, the days and the training models that we're using? What are our coaches teaching? And at the end of the day, if we're supposed to be providing elite opportunities, are we actually seeing the athletes? Are we actually training them how they should be trained or are we fooling ourselves? And it's creating a lot of, um, what's the word? Um, a lot of vulnerability, but a lot of honesty to admit that, have phone calls and conversations with the athletes and families that are selected for, you know, the top 1% admittedly going through our process and say, hey, we're not perfect, but how can we be better? And, you know, a lot of those conversations take place internally with the team but we're also taking a whole entire new stance on just being really honest and transparent with mm-hmm. the parents and athletes Very involved. So, I mean, I, I, again, we all come through different uh, cultures and experiences. I think that key word you mentioned, Jordan, is, is being vulnerable with your stakeholders. I mean, I think if you're truly going to facilitate, uh, you know, a language change, uh, a, a different outlook or perspective on, on what, what's going on, you need to be vulnerable yourself as a leader. Um, you know, if you're going in there with an iron fist approach, probably ain't going to connect with them first and foremost as a, as a person. And therefore, mm. anything that comes next is just not going to it's just not going to stick. Um, yeah, I mean, Vlad, back to your point, I guess, you know, there's and it kind of links quite nicely, obviously, with Martins. Is there in your institution, obviously, you said, you know, most coaches come out of where you're at. Um, do you is there any? tools that you guys go through for, for people to come through and, and really navigate the, the complexity of sports and, and obviously the fact that we were in the people business and, and then heightening those bright spots, as you said, with, with the organizations when they go out into the wild. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, first of all, I have to highlight that the first sport in here is obviously ice hockey, but through our institution going through uh, multiple sports, of course, the football, the basketball, you can find, uh, in the students, like all kinds of sports that that are present, and uh, something what we just spoke about being centered around the children uh, here in uh, in our institution and specifically in the university, our work is uh, based on the you know the competence of the students and it's centered around them, which is makes makes this place quite unique. You know, I've. I graduated from uh, the this university in 2018 with my bachelor's degree, and uh, the first day when I started in 2015, I was told that Vlad, by the way, in upcoming three and a half years, you're not going to have a single exam. I was like, what kind of dream school is that? <laughs> that there are no exams, and everything is competence based. That we we have coaching clinics that the students have to run to demonstrate the. The competence that hey I can run practice. Then there are so many projects due to the cooperation with the Finnish Ice Hockey Association and other federations that the students are put actually in a real world. That in, instead of writing an exam about you know uh, e- e- explaining the short term uh, practice planning, you actually run a camp for national team level players. And that's what happened with me in my second year. I ran a skill development camp for a Finnish women's national team. That was quite a shocking experience, but surely it was one of the best learning experiences out there. And the and those projects are kind of tailored for students. And if if your uh, competence is in strength training, of course you would get most of the projects about the you know strength training 
development and uh, player development or coach development. And here the program is built around the four main uh, four main areas of development, technical, tactical, physical, and psychological. And so throughout the course, you have to go through everything, but it's, it's, you know, there is a certain limit that you need to reach in each of the areas, but then you're given the freedom to explore for yourself what you want to, what you want to specify in. And that was interesting that, how I mentioned it's based on competence and we had students who are 18 years old and we had students who are 40. And so the students who are 40, who already ran so many, you know, projects say like uh, uh, initiation hockey school, those students didn't have to take it again. They, they be graded right away that, Hey, here's your, here are your credit points, but you haven't done uh, this or that. So you you're going towards more of a, other competencies that you want to develop. And every student has a tutor uh, that helps him or her to develop own competencies and find that path towards what they want to achieve. And the program is based at first two years, you spend it on campus studies with those mini projects, like I mentioned. And the last year you have to spend in a internship. Okay. So uh, there you are, how I say you are, actually going into the real world and you work for one year. Meanwhile, you're writing your thesis at the same time. And, you know, this transition happened, I believe, I I don't want to lie, 2013, I would say. And maybe at some point we can bring in the person who actually did it, Jukka Tikka. He is now the uh, director of coach coach and uh, athlete education out here. And I'm sure he w- he'll be able to tell a more complete story. But uh, what I'm trying to get at to is that as soon as we are, you know, trying to change change something, all right, there is, of course, there's going to be a rocky road in, in front of us or non-linear way of how things are getting changed. And what Mark mentioned, those uh, in- interactions are vital because mm-hmm. the teachers need to understand the students Students need to understand teachers. How in the world am I going to be assessed if there are no exams? That was that was a nonsense to me, completely coming out of the Russian culture, of course, because it's just the lecture, writing the exam, and thanks and bye. But mm-hmm. it was, I would say that was shocking, but at the same time, I would say life-changing experience. And I got to coach a lot during the first two years. I learned a lot of things by pretty much by doing, but also being surrounded with the opportunities to do research. And that's how during my first two years, I was able to publish two scientific articles because I was given freedom to do so. If, if you have an interest uh, in research, go ahead, buddy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a short story about like, you know, our, our institution out here and how these change, you know, has been happening in uh, in the past few years, and I believe now it's getting more and more more and more stable in in the way how the uh, student teacher in- interactions are built and how the courses are built as well. And kind of an interesting uh, way of of educating coaches. I think it's very um, holistic. I think. Yeah, and in case if some of you guys are interested in interns in football coaches or volleyball give me a call. There are plenty of students out here who are, who are hungry for, for work placement in their third year. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we get back on the field, I might give you a call. Mm. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, anything more that anyone wants to add on, on, yeah, on, I, I think, an impo- sorry, one thing I meant, Cliff, it's really, really important. It gets back to what Jan and York, the Dutch FA said that you, you know, the classic thing, and this is something I think really almost unique for soccer. I, I, not something that i've seen other sports adopt in it soccer is like oh they said look don't try and you do use a dutch model our dutch model reflects our culture and its idiosyncrasies of our culture it's that's what that's what it's built on you cannot plant take it and just plant it in another culture in another country it doesn't work and i know jason was the exact same as well speaking about that when he took over the job is like he, he was very quick to pick up this because I've seen now recently 
there was an article uh, in an Irish newspaper about the Football Association of Ireland that it ran about somebody was speaking about, yeah, um, the Ajax model. We, we're going to base on the Ajax model. This is Ireland. Ireland, most kids play hurling in Gaelic football. Mm. You know? So, again, I think that's really important what Jason, Jan and York said in that podcast back about you cannot take a system or a model from another country and just dump it into yours. Well, the, 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 the key thing, isn't it? You need to understand it and you need to dig deeper before, because there, you, there are going to be things in there, concepts, theory that you can certainly um, transition and adapt. But unless you understand what they're doing and why and where it's come from, then, you know, as you say, just dropping it into your culture, it's just going to blow up. Britain, you were going to say yeah. something. Yeah. So um, we had the, uh, the local professional club here um, they're doing some, uh, player identification and some training and that sort of thing. And, uh, they were taking the Icelandic model and, you know, and what, what, how they had evaluated it is that, you know, Iceland had a, a similar number of players per capita, um, in a similar climate, you know, they were having to train part of the, the time indoor and, you know, look what their rankings you know, their rankings, they went from, I don't remember what they are. So don't quote me on the numbers, but, you know, 500th to 20th. Um, and then uh, what was great, uh, I think, I don't know if I knew Mark very well at the time, but he wrote, um, knock, knock. Do you remember this, Mark? Knock, knock. Who's there? <laughs> Iceland. Yeah. Iceland who? That's, <laughs> that's show business for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, as soon as they, as soon as they were eliminated, the, the Icelandic model, um, it disappeared from their, the curriculum from the local club. And, uh, I don't know if they're investigating our, our culture, um, or if they're, you know, trying to find another one that's, you know, already built with, you know, some other similarities where, you know, this country has most people with brown hair just like us. So <laughs> I'd say if, 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 if I had a dollar for every time someone said, do what Iceland does, I'd be rich. I won't be doing this with you fellas. That's for sure. Well, I mean, um, you're like right there. I, I mean, it's probably. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, and it, it is, I mean, Martin's lived in Nova Scotia. I mean, in, it, the difference between the culture in the city, the suburbs and versus in the rural areas in itself is completely different. You know, so we're trying to figure out how to blend those two societies together because there is my major political um, tension there, you know, um, and Martin lived it. So trying to do, do uh, you know, develop a sports system that, that services kids in your own province, in your own country, is completely different. And the needs and the gaps are completely different from the rural areas. I'm sure it's the same in Utah as well. Like it's you're dealing with different constraints. Yeah, no, totally, totally. Um Anything else then on, on, on culture? I mean, have we got to a point where, you know, uh, we've got some strategies or maybe some tools to go back? Obviously, I'm hearing a lot around, you know, you really do have to observe. You really do have to ask questions. You have to be curious to know it more. Simply going in with your understanding and experience and story and trying to push it down uh, the society that you're dealing with is just not going to work. So that takes time. So time is probably a, a key ingredient here. Um, anything else that you know people listening can start because we've got we've got time i mean yeah i know we do with covid we have yeah. time is there anything else we can be doing to try okay. and get to this point i would like to just add on to to this you know to share a little bit more of the of the experiences I, i've been gathering over the years um we, we've been talking about being vulnerable i think jordan touched on this and vlad was talking about the importance of you know the people you know which are surrounding yourself um, you know, we're, we're having a role which, which we play in our environment, but we're also part of a team. You know, the team can be the, the leaders within your club, you know, the board and, and et cetera, which can actually impact the, the operations within the club, the direction of the club and, you know, the impact we're having on, on the members. But, you know, I've, I've experienced different extremes, to be honest, you know, when, when people kind of like want it a lot of interventions or a lot of initiatives bringing, you know, being bringing in quite fast, but being scared, actually letting them to happen or being implemented because they didn't quite understand them. But on the other side, you know, 
have experienced what what the power is just to to let people to be heard what do they think what is what is actually happening what are they looking for and one of the most valuable you know knowledge i've gathered was basically understanding or realizing that sometimes people are having a lot of questions and people are uncertain about the programs or what is happening in the club just because the club is not being transparent enough about what are they offering and sometimes you know they've been going through this phase of copying and pasting without actually knowing objectively what they're talking about or what they're doing what they're offering so then you know there was that confusion that you know something was coming for example from above saying, hey, this is what we want to do and this is what we want to achieve. But there was no follow up in order you know, to educate the, the, the people you know, within the team, the collective team, about what it means and what are all the, the, the details within that and, and engage their interest and in, to get to know more about it, not to hammer it down, as you said, but engage them in the, you know, in the growing process. Mm. Very good. Yeah, and, and to that point, like as in my role at SNS prior to leaving it, you know, if you go and look at clubs like policies and procedures and, and you know, technical plan, it's like 100 pages. And there's things that contradict the one thing to the other. It's just one one leader's copied something exactly. and, they, and they've not even edited the stuff that existed before. It's just an absolute mess of a document. Um, but you're bang on, Martin. And that, that's common. That's common, I think, particularly in the North American market. I don't know what in Europe, Mark, obviously, Mark Vlad might have a more of a a broader perspective on that, but that's very, very common. Or job descriptions, right? <laughs> yeah, well, job descriptions, they're, they're, the, they're the best. <laughs> 10 pages of things that have just been added to, yeah. Yeah, I think Martin and Mark, kind of the whole entire discussion and talk about listening and having individuals ask questions. And I think Vlad a little bit too, when you said, um, you know, it's incredible to have the opportunity to learn by doing and to be just around the opportunities to interact and research. I think back on like myself and, you know, our team, I feel the most impactful moments I have if I'm looking at just the coaching side is when I'm on the ground at the training programs, listening to these coaches interact and work together. And, you know, they, they have some incredible ideas and some really great, um, initiatives that they give in terms of advice as to how they could work better together. And while, you know, it's interesting to hear that a lot of you guys are in hybrid roles of coaching, education, and athlete development, I'm strictly kind of on the athlete development side. So that's where, you know, it's really great to hear the coaches talk about, you know, ways that they could improve. I think that ultimately, um, the, what I'm trying to get at with the point is that, um, you know, just listening to those questions allows us and our team to do some incredible work. I think like at a specific example is every holiday, kind of in December, we host a holiday training program and we let our youth national team boys head coach run the training and we have additional prominent coaches come in and work with them. And one thing that um, they really voiced this past year is that there's never been a way to have some kind of congruency or consistency among training programs because we operate in different levels of training programs for age groups. So one age group might have four different levels and these coaches have never had the opportunity to communicate, collaborate, or make sure that kind of like the curriculum that they're putting forward and programming is consistent. And I think that this year, just by listening and having interactions with those coaches, to your point, you know, Martin and Vlad and Mark, just having the inspection of ourselves and are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? where we were able to kind of create a framework that allowed coaches to look across programming and see what the head coaches and the youth national team staff and the, even up to our senior level, what they're doing in their gyms to create an actual consistent USA way. And I think that's something where, you know, until we had this pause and until we were able to really be vulnerable and ask ourselves, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? We felt we were successful in that, we were hosting training programs and we were moving through our programming, but there never seemed to be until this year in this shift of culture where we're asking ourselves the questions, are we actually being consistent? Are we actually providing world-class training? Are we giving the national team resources all the way down to the lowest level of programming so that every USA program is a USA program? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where if it's a self-inspection or it's a question of development, I think that's one that really hits home for me is, 
Um, it goes back to those mission statements that we have. And no matter what those mission statements are, it's, that's one that sticks out to me is world class in every attempt at what we do. And if I'm looking at our high performance side, like our team is recognizing that we're moving through the motions, but we're not ultimately at the level of world class. And it takes a lot of listening from the athletes and from the coaches and who we're working with to put those pieces together and see how we can be better moving forward with the new system and new culture that'll actually kind of emulate that world-class model. But so you're actually just investigating yourselves as well. Yeah, that's, I'd say that's the biggest initiative and the biggest piece of meat on our plate right now is, oh, are we actually doing what you know, we say we do? That, that is really cool to hear. And I think that this is, and this should never stop yeah. because I think that's for, for me, well, us working, okay, I just speak with James Vaughan about it today, who, who works in the research and development department, me as well. We're, we're, we've never stopped investigating. We just keep doing it. Yeah. Keep evaluating, keep thinking, okay, where is it going? What, what do we need to amplify? What do we need to dampen? Because even when there's big progressions being made, there's still other things we have to work with That's all right. the time. Yeah, so it's, it's an on, so when you say investigating culture, you know, now I've investigated. This is what we're going to do. It doesn't. No, it's ongoing. It it actually doesn't yeah. end. Yeah, because and that's. Stop, I, I don't mean to come off and say like we're not successful either. I mean our girls youth national team for the first time in USA volleyball's history won the gold medal at the world championships yeah, last but, year, and we. That's worth investigating but, as well. Yeah, but did we actually develop them, each athlete as an individual? Did they get better? Like, right. are we actually making uh, positive impact and change? And I think yeah. that's that's where medals can't really give that. You have to give an inspection as to, you know, those questions like, are we actually seeing the athletes as often as we think we are? Are we actually making local change? Are we, I don't know, introducing a culture and actually building the culture that we say we are? And I yeah. think that's where it's that's really fun. great. That's yeah, really fantastic. Yeah. And Jordan, I mean, for, for a high performing Olympic program to be looking at it as the person and putting the person more so at the forefront than even the, you know, obviously the success of the program is pretty rare. I mean, it's pretty rare stuff. So that's phenomenal. And um, I'm sure there'll probably be people who um, are listening can to I this. Say something, Mike? Did, yeah. Did, did, the, the, just the, probably from my experience, the traditional way now to work should be if you if if you say Olympic volleyball goes, we're really good. Let's structure and organize everything, <laughs> <laughs> and let's have it online exactly everything, and let's hyper structure, hyper organize it. This is what happens in so many successful countries. Let uh, ninety four came second and uh, came uh, got the bronze in the World Cup, and they just hyper structured everything without paying attention to where do these players come from, who are they, how did they get here. What happened? No, let's hyperstructure everything. Mm. Mm. I I would. We don't need to go very far down this, but uh, what is why is it so important to have like a consistent model all the way through your entire organization? Why is it important to have a style of play? And why is that? Why is that style of play? Why is it important for that style of play? You know, to, all of your teams adopt that. If you know, to quote Mark again, if we're looking for unique individuals, why are we treating everything the same? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And to me, I think it's one part that I thought of early on in the question of culture is where we stand as a national governing body, in that. If I'm looking at what we do in high performance, a lot of it comes from the top and we try and emulate what our national teams do. And to your question, Britton, I think it's really interesting that in our time of seeing like John Spraw and Karch Karai at the, at the helm, um, there's a lot of opportunity to where we, we have a system. We have a USA volleyball system where we train, we work on our tempo and our speed of how fast we can push the ball and that we can draw the middle to go with the, you know, like a gap and we can hit them on the go. And it, all through all of that and through having a strategy, I think the main point that Karch and John and a lot of the culture um, that's being out there right now is that we try and we, we build that system around where athletes can shine uniquely within what they bring to that system. So mm -hmm. I think it's, an, it's a strange kind of like hybrid of, yes, there's a system, 
but in thinking of your question, our national team coaches firmly recognize that that system can only be bettered by the individual qualities that athletes bring. And I think that there was even a moment in VNL, I think it was the Volleyball Nations League where, um, geez, the, the, travel schedule, the, the travel schedule was out of this world. It was like a different country every week. And uh, I think it was Karch's side on the women's team. You know, there were different rosters every single week, <laughs> different athletes because they have so much depth. And I think that you would see one week, teams would be scouting what we did the week before. And then we would bring in a middle like Haley Washington who just introduced completely different tempos and movements in the middle that teams were not scouting. And it kept up with USA Fast. It kept up with the system and offense that they're trying to run. But it was something that only Haley and the setter could do because they had collegiate time playing together, I believe, was the option. And that's where I think I'm not an expert. And a lot of what I'm saying comes from having a great team and learning from like Karch and John and all of them. But it's you can see that there's evidence kind of in how Karch runs the team that yes, we have a system, but there's no negligence towards like what unique attributes athletes bring to where it only works mm. better. The system I think is my point. Yeah. Adaptable, yeah. Like, I think that's adaptable, adaptable athletes that add value. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's I, principles. I this, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I had this, uh, I had this conversation with, uh, with leadership here in, in our area and uh, we kind of discussed, you know, having a, you know, having a style of play and, you know, that, were, that went across all of these Utah teams. But when we look at, when we look at all of the teams, you know, all over the world, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi play in the same position in some regard. And how they do it is completely different, right? So, um, you know, we look, we, we look at the, like a player profile as a part of a system of play or a style of play. And we say, okay, well, you know, our sevens and tens, or sorry, our sevens and elevens, those are wingers in football. If you're not a soccer person, um, you know, they got to be able to get up and down our outside backs. They have to be able to overlap. They have to be able to, you know, cross the ball. The service has got to be there and this and that is messy on a wing because of the service. No, there's different, there's different opportunities that emerge with different players. And mm -hmm. so um, I think where we're going is uh, maybe less uniformity mm -hmm. and more coaching education yep. to help uh, guide and identify um, opportunities within yeah. the context of a match. I think probably what you're referring to is this kind of global to local game models that are being imposed. Mm -hmm. Oh, the first team plays this way, and we have a game model all the way through the club. And then by the time the young, you know, and really what you're doing is you end up with probably young players if you impose a game model top down global, locally. You, you, you really over constrain their local to global interactions. Those local interactions are over constrained. And you, you know, you end up probably with players that can play a model of the game as opposed to the game itself. Mm -hmm. But they can play a role in it, like it's a play. Which is, and, and I, I get it. I think this is also something that's, big I think in in soccer at the moment is this this idea and it it's been very much misunderstood it's it's probably something that's been inherited from Friday's tactical periodization where they have these game models and Friday is being very clear about this that you know this is only for, for professional senior players but still you know I've seen clubs with 13 year olds with a game model and 12 year olds and, and then you, it even goes further down when you have nine year olds who with the passing patterns that are regurgitated in the game that they've rehearsed. So yeah, it's, it is. So it I, is it, yeah. I asked um, this um, with a professional MLS team and they were defining their game model and they asked me to stand up and they're like, what are you about six, two? Yeah. Well, uh, I can tell you right now, you're not our nine. You're not our number nine. Right. He's like, cause we want our nine to be able to press all game. And, you know, I don't know you as a player, but something tells me you're not going to be able to press all game. And so I said, so if, if Zlatan wants to come to your team, are you not going to take him? And no, no, no. We would take him for sure. You know, we thought if we actually thought he would be a great fit here. Like, okay, so what's, you know, what's in the market, what the players are doing, what they bring to the table does influence your game model as it yep. should. 
Yeah. Um, just want to, this is great stuff, but there is some engagement as well out in the World Wide Web. Um, point to the whole game model thing. Um, I just want people's opinion quickly here is, uh, it was from Mike Gee. He said, um, basically, you know, it's a selling tactic for clubs. You're trying to uh, obtain memberships. So if you can sell this wonderful game model that, that you know, develops this wonderful type of player, it, it gets eaten up by the consumer, which unfortunately, and Mark, you made this point on the children's license, and I've used it ever since, the consumer is perceived as the parent, whereas actually we need to go for parent as a partner and the mm. child is the consumer. And we need to figure out what's in the best interest of the child. So, yeah, I mean, that is a major reason that that, that it's like you're buying this product, um, particularly in the North American market where dollars are, you know, really up there for a product. So that was a good point from Mike. And the other part point I wanted to throw at you is, and we'll kind of wrap it up after this point. Um, Addy, uh, Mark, you know, is it Addy? Have I said it right? Stovall from SFA yeah, yeah. said that at the end of the day around the culture, we need to spend more time with coach education if we're really going to influence, obviously, club culture. Yeah. And I would actually go one level above. And it's something that Jason DeVos uh, agrees on and is trying to do. The, like, we don't have like a technical director diploma. Like something that actually, because you, when you're a technical director, you're a hybrid of a, of a position. So you work with coaches, you work with players, and therefore you are responsible for coach education in your club. There's no real um, secondary education in particularly where we are, where you equip the leaders to develop their coaches effectively so that they can therefore impact the overall culture in your club. So it's, it's kind of two tiers missing for me. It's, we do need to spend more time in coach ed but are we equipping our leaders who are responsible for that in their clubs? Uh, there, there is, there's not a lot of uh, opportunities out there that right now where you can get that. It's usually through informal processes like podcasts, Zoom calls, that kind of stuff. Just want your opinion on the two things. So the, uh, I'll throw it back out. The game model as a, as a brand and then the coach education focus to affect cultures. Just throw it out there before we wrap up. Um, yeah, I can definitely comment at least in terms of you know, sharing what, uh, what I'm experiencing here in North America and Canada in particular, uh, as you said, the first point, uh, you know, about offering some sort of services or predicting the pathway of the players, and it is actually being attached to, you know, the, the high cost being involved in actually, you know, being, being part of organized sport and, you know, being part of clubs. So I, I'm actually sometimes feeling really, really bad for some of the, some of the people who might not have a lot of knowledge about, you know, child development or, you know, the organizations and how that work because the, the messaging or the messages they're, they're receiving are so different. And it probably is a little bit more appealing if somebody comes to you and say, you know, hey, I, I would like your seven years old to come to my club because I, I'm going to make him a professional player. Then if I'm going to actually come and say, listen, I, I just want to, you know, welcome your, your child to being part of our organization and we're going to try to create the environment which will help him to learn, develop at his own pace. And we'll, we'll see how far it will go. We'll, we'll see, you know, what's going to come after, you know, came, came out of this. So, you know, the messages are, are quite different. And uh, I think that sometimes the, the influence of some, some organizations, and this is not really disrespecting anybody or putting in their fingers. Sometimes to me, it feels like they, they want people to, to feel that they're lucky to actually be part of their organization instead of you know us being lucky to to have their child being part of our organization and very good you know being part of that family well done martin yeah really good way to sum that one up anything on the coach educators before we wrap this up and reset for another week i thought vlad gave some good ideas there about future of coach education of what they were doing in finland i think that was mm. really good Vlad. yeah and uh you know First, I want to still throw a little comment about the game model. And uh, I think to, to an extent it gives uh, to parents uh, a sense of psychological security that, hey, mm, that, that, that was going to be happening to my kid. But as soon as you say, oh, hey, we're using a nonlinear approach that, you know, we're going to raise an individual. The question is always like, what are you going to do with my kid? What's, what's going to happen with, with him so I don't, I don't want to advocate for the for the model but i can you know relate to an extent how the parents are thinking as you know in my uh, past few years i've been coaching in a junior club even though i was uh, coaching at the older age group the questions were okay how are you going to play why are you going to play this way 
and quite commonly it's like you know what happens uh, at times is that as soon as one professional organization starts winning championships kids are just start flooding into into the other other junior organization which is absolutely you know not even related with the with the pro team and mm. they're like you know how i say as soon as the head coach changes the whole system in the pro team is changing but the junior team stays the same you know but pro pro sport and uh junior sport is a two two different things completely yeah, yeah. and yeah think about performance the whole- performance yeah. versus learning vlad on your psychological it's i want to see yeah, performing yeah. versus learning which is you can't measure you can't see oh yeah oh yeah and uh again about the coach education and a little bit of culture in uh you know in uh in say like in some organizations, the coach developers have so much of the management tasks to take care of that their even hands are not even getting to the coach development. Did you have time to, you know, speak with with that coach about their past weeks of training? Well, I've been making, uh, you know, schedules for the for the for the ices in, in different ice rinks. Well, you know, maybe to an extent, it's not a challenge in some countries. It's not a challenge of coach education, but rather uh, what we mentioned earlier, a 10 page job description. Mm. Maybe that's, that's the issue. What, what do you actually focus on? Do you focus on coach development or are you focusing on that the team goes on the ice consistently three times a week at the, at the exact same time and how in the world are you going to adjust yep. to the changes in the game schedule, you know, but also there should be a uh, part of, of the education about the mentorship. And uh, we have that here where the uh, coach developers are coming in for the specific, um, I would say intensive course, but also what's quite common uh, in Finnish ice hockey specifically uh, is that there are skill coaches in the junior side from, I believe they go from under, under eight to under 14s. And there they oversee specifically the uh, coach development of the volunteer coaches and they are kind of helping and mentoring them on the practice design which is i i would say is one of the game changers for finnish national system that happened in the past few years again that, interactions yeah mm. oh yeah and all of the skill coaches are getting together here in Virmaki, getting exposed to the multiple uh, amounts of uh, research in information about the skill learning. And then they go back to the clubs and then they look what's happening in their own club. And then from there, they think about, okay, how do we adjust the information that I just learned with the kids that are out there? Brilliant. Well, I think, I think what we do know is we're all going to go and visit Finland next. <laughs> yeah. Welcome just, guys. Yeah. Listen, fellas, um, Unbelievable stuff, really. Um, you know, uh, again, it's not. It's it's difficult. We know it's difficult. We're not here to provide literally the solutions, but I think there is some great suggestions for people just to maybe start looking at things. And um, yeah, I think the key things for anyone: observation, ask questions, interactions. You know, um, there's some really good stuff there. Uh, anything from anyone else before we close off the live stream, and then we can wrap up offline. Yeah, make sure we everyone stay on when we go offline. Yep, be really good. Yeah, I just want to thank any uh, you guys for getting involved tonight. It's, it's really, really good, really beneficial yep. for me yeah. personally. I'm really, really happy. Thanks. I would thank you guys too, but also just another shout out that you know a lot of what I'm saying too is just from conversation within the team and from a lot of others in the organization. So by no means is it just my thoughts, but something that we're all trying to collectively change. So. Brilliant. And I mean, all right, gentlemen. Well, what we do here, we we interact. Sorry, Mike, for in- yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, this is the best PD I, I honestly I've had over the last um, um, you know was it twelve weeks, Mark? That's how COVID weeks is twelve episodes, yeah, twelve weeks. weeks. Yeah, we, we count our, our podcast in COVID weeks. Yeah, yeah, it's been brilliant. So I want to thank all of you and hopefully we'll uh, maybe even have a conversation to have you back. There's still so many questions that you've posed to us we haven't even got to. But um, thanks a lot. And we're going to wrap this up right now. We're offline, gentlemen. That was good, guys. Thanks very much. Hope you enjoyed that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.
Yeah. That was great. Can't believe yeah. we, that worked technologically first and foremost. Yeah. There was a little bit of a delay. So I was watching Twitter and I'd talk into the group and Mark was talking. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> Mark's on mute. Yeah, we had about at one point 30 people. Um, the, the questions really started to flow um, towards the, the really the second third of the conversation. I was just trying to buy time because people were going and going and going, just waiting yeah. for a moment to get in there. But that no, was good. Um, I, I think it was beneficial. Um, if again, we'll maybe reach out and um, figure out what the next plan is. We've got quite a lot of content, I think, to, to, to continue to explore. Um, Britain, Mark, anything from you? No, I think um, it, it's, it's really good we have these conversations. I think it's really important because I'm fed up with listening to podcasts with all with, that give you all the answers. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm enjoying that uh, we have so many different sports being involved. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, the, you know, football, volleyball, all these other things. You know, I took, uh, I took, two months last year to coach basketball for the first time. Um, I didn't grow up playing basketball, anything more than two on two or three on three. And uh, the culture in basketball is very different than the culture in, in soccer for the same kids, the same area, the same parents. 